worry about the weather in upstate New York. I know it's cold and there's a lot of snow. So <laughs> forgive me for that. Uh, thank you, Senator Serino, Senator Ort, and the lawmakers that invited me here to speak. Um, I am here on behalf of the thousands of New York families that deserve answers. We've been waiting for answers for almost a year now. And I've said this many times, it's not about politics. This is about doing the right thing. I've often mentioned when I am asked, I am not a political person. It's not, it's not about politics. We lost people on both sides of the aisle as a result of a state's terrible, tragic policy. And now we need people on both sides of the aisle to take an active role in getting justice. The Attorney General's report was a step in the right direction, but it confirms our fears. It's our worst fears. Not enough for us to sit and wait until the end of February and hope we get additional answers and hope. We've been hoping for months. We've been waiting long enough. Those with the power to do so must take immediate action to launch a full investigation using subpoena power to get answers that families like mine deserve. This is not going to go away because we're not going away. And Governor Cuomo, who cares? Shame on you. We care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Your heartfelt testimony has been, it touches all of our hearts, so thank you. Uh, right now, I'd like to ask Leader Ort um, to say a few words, Leader. Uh, hey, Senator Serino, I really don't have anything to, uh, to, uh, to add. I'm certainly not gonna follow up uh, the great Janice Dean uh, because that's just not a position I wanna be in nor should anybody wanna be in that position. But uh, I just wanna thank her and I wanna thank um, the families who never gave up hope during this process. We're really here in large part because of you and your efforts because absent that, this would have all been chalked up to Albany noise and Albany politics and the governor would have continued to play his game and obfuscate uh, and Commissioner Zucker would have continued to put forward bogus reports in whitewashing. Uh, but were it not for Janice and the families on social media, in the media, every day, calling their elected officials, demanding answers, uh, that's why we're here today. So when people say it doesn't matter, why do you keep doing this? You know, no one listens. They do. You, you, it does matter. It does matter. It's hard and it shouldn't take this much effort and it shouldn't be this difficult to get to the truth. But, you know, sometimes the best things in life, the things that are most necessary are difficult. And I want to thank all of you for doing what you've done uh, because I think you've given hope to other families. You've given hope. To, there are lots of families out there who can't sit there and do what you've been doing. Janice has used her platform that she's privileged to have and she's used it to, really to do great great things. So I want to thank you, Janice, uh, again, for everything you're doing, uh, even aside from the weather. I know we made that joke earlier, but uh, you're doing a fan phenomenal job. I also want to thank Senator Serino and Senator Tedisco, my whole conference. But Senator Serino has been on this from day one. She, she, she took this. She's the ranker on the aging committee. This was a very important issue to her. And before, you know, before any Senate uh, leadership on the majority before the governor, before Howard Zucker, she was out there calling for answers. Senator Jim Tedisco was out there calling for answers. They were working across the aisle um, and they've both done this with, you know, in the spotlight and outside the spotlight. I can tell you when, we're, when the doors are closed here in Albany, they are asking the same questions. They are having the same conversations when the cameras are not on them. And that's the sign of good people and good leaders. So I wanna thank Senator Serino, I wanna thank Senator Tedisco and my entire conference. Uh, and again, Janice and the families, thank you for being here. Uh, and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with all of you. We will get the answers, we will get the truth and we will hold people accountable. And we will also make sure we're making different choices going forward so we don't repeat the same mistakes. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Leader Ort. I appreciate your kind words. And now I would like to introduce Assemblyman Will Barkley. He's the Republican conference leader in the assembly. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you, Senator. It's great to be here. I have to follow the great Rob leader, Rob Ort, uh, who followed the great Janice Dean. But uh, 
Yeah, I just want to echo what Leader Ort said. Uh, thank everybody for being here. Jan Steen, thank you for your leadership. You've done a great job. Uh, let's keep pounding this drum. That's what we got to do, keep pounding this drum. It's unforgivable that the governor has not been, you know, answering our questions on this. And the only way we're going to get it is get the majority to have these hearings and have them with uh, subpoena power so we can get the information from the second floor. So I appreciate uh, Senator Serino, Leader Ward, the Republican Conference in the Senate. Uh, obviously, we've been banging the drum here in the uh, Republican Conference in the Assembly. And I uh, just want to introduce Kevin Byrne, who has been leading the charge for us uh, here in the Assembly. So Kevin, can I pass it to you? Thank you, Leader, and, and thank you for all your support and leadership uh, behind every action that I have taken and our colleagues have taken to try to get real answers uh, for the families who lost loved ones. Uh, just to reiterate again what uh, Senator Serino, my colleague, just a little bit to the north of me, said why we're here. You know, we were here today with the plan of listening to Dr. Zucker and following up with him during the budget hearings. And, and until that was switched to later in the month, February 25th, um, we had to make some adjustments. You know, a lot of information's changed. The AG's report came out. Um, but during those budget hearings, there's a lot of different things we need to ask. But one of the things was to follow up on those forums and hearings that we had all the way back in August, where we demanded information on a full complete count of the fatalities that occurred from getting COVID-19 in nursing homes and the consequences of the actions of uh, this governor's administration and his Department of Health. Since then, uh, we've had multiple bipartisan hearings and forums. Uh, many of us have written to the CDC. Uh, we've written to President Trump. Uh, we've worked together in a bipartisan manner with colleagues in the assembly, uh, namely Assemblyman Ron Kim, writing to President Biden to try to get answers. Members of both houses have introduced bipartisan state legislation for an independent investigation with subpoena powers, um, but we're not done yet. You know, many of us advocates, uh, legislators have been branded and labeled by the governor and his administration and his surrogates as, quote, ugly and, quote, political. The AG's report went over many different things, uh, including the state and federal response into COVID-19 in our nursing homes. But one of the most significant things that it did was it validated our concerns that we've been voicing for many, many months. Now it's time to act. We have a legislative call to action. In response to the AG's, AG's report, as was mentioned by Leader Barclay, uh, we've petitioned uh, various committees in the assembly for hearings for the purpose of exercising our legislative subpoena powers to mandate that the DOH and the Cuomo administration provide all information that we're seeking regarding the complete uh, nursing home data, uh, communications from the Department of Health, governor's office and other parties involved that led to controversial state directives like on March 25th uh, and anything else that's pertaining to the spread of this virus in our nursing homes. We support a bipartisan effort uh, for investigations and also support an expansion of the federal investigation. You know, this, this has been um, a virus that has plagued every state across the country, not just New York. The federal government has an obligation here DOJ has said they were investigating. Uh, that investigation, as it was initially announced and reported, was more narrow in scope to publicly run facilities. That should be expanded. And I think the AG's report only strengthens that call to expand that investigation. Uh, again, uh, we're here today because um, we wanted to question the health commissioner. And uh, one of the things I said early on in those forums back in August was that we were not just done listening to the victims. And since we cannot hear from the commissioner today, we thought it was appropriate to hear from some of the, the families who lost loved ones and hear from them and kind of follow through on that promise that we were not done listening. Uh, I don't have the privilege of knowing uh, the Lizzie family directly, but I have a little bit of information I wanted to share as I introduce uh, Cindy Lizzie and her brothers, uh, Ed and Phil. Uh, they lost their mother, Agnes, to COVID-19 in April of 2020. And because of the governor's restrictions on nursing home visitations, they were not allowed to visit their mother for more than a month before she passed away. Agnes was a resident of the Tarishian house up in Albany, uh, but was transferred to a hospital to be treated for COVID-19. Uh, uh, Ted also lost his father-in-law uh, under similar circumstances. And uh, with that, I just want to introduce this family, uh, Cindy, you know, our heart goes out to you. 
your family, your loved ones. So many of us uh, lost people uh, we care deeply about. We're robbed of the opportunity to have a proper funeral and say goodbye the way we wanted to. We're all seeking answers and I'll turn this over to you and, and just thank you for your, your courage, your passion um, to, to be with us here this evening, after morning. Thank you, Cindy. I think you have to unmute. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, beautiful. Um, Mike Frazier, thank you so much for contacting me and giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, I'll start with, we'll let my brother Phil and Ted uh, speak as well. Um, you, you basically said exactly what happened uh, and we felt totally out of control and we felt like no one was listening to us, including the nursing home. They were extremely uh, uncooperative in the beginning to communicate with us and uh, thank you for listening to us now. Thank you. We initially, when we were asked initially to, um, to leave the nursing home, we understood the severity of, of the uh, of COVID-19 uh, and uh, we understood that we were told it was gonna be maybe two weeks initially. Um, uh, we didn't understand um, afterwards why um, they weren't taking proper precautions in the, uh, in the nursing home. I mean, they come from the outside as we did and they were, they were not taking the proper precautions at that time. They were not given a directive apparently or whatever the reason was. Um, when, I, when I heard about the uh, allowing COVID-19 patients back into nursing homes, we heard that on the third floor of the Teresian house, that they were, um, they were preparing for that to allow COVID-19 patients in the nursing homes. So I, I contacted uh, Jim Cameron, who's the CEO of, of Teresian, and I asked him if that was, was true, you know, that uh, they were going to bring it back in. He said, oh, no. He said, uh, you know, only if uh, they, they get... Uh, COVID in, within, in the nursing home itself. I, I found out, and then I, I wasn't too pleased with the answer. I was suspicious of the answer. So I, I called uh, Dan McCoy, the county executive, Albany County executive. And I asked him also that the same question. And he said, uh, yeah, they're allowed to uh, bring COVID patients back inside in, into nursing homes um, from the outside. And that there was, uh, apparently there was money involved in the whole situation. I thought it was unconscionable. Um, it almost sounds like a, a Judas type of uh, reaction. Um, and then I, then I, uh, um, you know, I was concerned, so I, I contacted the uh, the bishop's office, uh, Albany, uh, Albany bishop's office, and uh, a couple times, and um, I got a call back from a father of Fort, uh, who was the vicar uh, from the diocese of Albany. And he's, he, uh, he it was, uh, in a condescending way, he said to me, um, you know, uh, you, you must trust in the Lord. And I said, uh, Father, I said, I, I trust in the Lord, but I don't trust in people. And I was very concerned for my mom. We were all concerned for, for our mom. We love her. We were there every single day. We visited her every single day. Um, it, was, it was a pleasure because our mom was everything to us, as was our dad. And, um, and she, you know, for until the time that she got COVID, we were unable really to contact her. Um, uh, occasionally we, we were able to uh, teleconference, but uh, for, the, you know, for one or two times, that was it. And we were very concerned that, because you, you have to advocate for your, your loved ones in the nursing home and not being there, we're, we were unable to advocate for our mom. And that concerned us, not that they, you know, some of the nurses and staff were not good people. We're not saying that, but, uh, you know, people just, you know, unless you're there all the time, unless you advocate for the, your loved ones, um, you really can't uh, appreciate that they can't get the proper care. I think that, uh, that we were able to, to help out with. And, um, and then we found out that uh, our mom uh, and on previously the 20th of April uh, was, was sick and they, they didn't know for sure what it was because she was never tested. So, uh, but she had the symptoms of, of that, of the COVID. So what we did was we, um, we, we were in constant contact with uh, the administration, uh, Jim Cameron, and uh, uh, the, 
uh, Mary uh, Grace Cahill, who was the head of nursing at Teresian, who uh, was, uh, was not transparent. Well, she was not transparent at all. You're right. She was not transparent. She was not, she didn't allow us to really, she didn't give us answers that we wanted to get. And then it was also a Mary Jean who was with Optum, which is the health provider uh, for United Healthcare. She was, she was helpful. She said that they were going to send our mom uh, because they could not take care of her in Teresian. They were going to send her to um, St. Peter's Hospital, which they did on the, on the night of the 20th of April. We, um, we were very, uh, obviously very concerned, what, you know, to, we, were just, we didn't know what it was. So we, uh, we actually went to the St. Peter's Hospital and they allowed us, my brother and I, into the hospital to visit our mom. And they were, they, we were told that she did test positive for COVID uh, and that, uh, you know, that uh, we mentioned hydroxychloroquine that we, we had thought would help because we heard so many good things about it. But uh, apparently it was, it was too far gone. She, and had, she had bilateral pneumonia. She had pneumonia and she was very, very, um, very, very sick. And that was on night of the 20th. Um, we then contacted the hospital several times and we were told that she was going into hospice care. And um, on the 21st, the night of the 21st, the morning of the 22nd, at four o'clock in the morning, I got a call from St. Peter's Hospital that our mother had passed. And it was, it was even to this day, it's heart-wrenching to think of our mom. And then to hear the response of our governor. Our leader. Our leader, so-called, <laughs> the emperor of, of Albany, um, to hear his response, well, they're going to die anyway, it's God's fault, and so on and so forth, was so, so uh, awful. And, and, and compassion. No, no compassion whatsoever uh, for any of the loved ones, you know. And then the other day, I hear him mention his father, and I said, what does that have to do, his father died, what does that have to do with what's going on now, what's going on now here in Albany, in this state? It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. And um, that's, you know, that's the story that I know my brother, my brother Ted uh, lost his father-in-law also to the same, uh, you know, the same disease. So I'll let uh, my, my brother talk also. Thank you, all of you, for, for doing what you're doing. This is so important. Um, we have to get to the bottom of it. We have to make those who made those bad decisions uh, pay for what they're doing. Um, we lost loved our, our loved ones. Um, two weeks after my mom passed, I lost my father-in-law. He was also at the Teresian house. And it's just, it's just a nightmare. Um, but again, you know, please continue doing what you're doing. We will be here if you need us for anything mm -hmm. to, to get to the bottom of this. Thank you very much. We, we, we completely support Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for Thank doing you. this. And you know, it is a nonpartisan this is nonpartisan. Nothing to do with politics. It politics. should never be politics. And, and if someone makes a mistake, you'll owe up to the mistake. Own up to it. That's right. all. Plain and simple. That's all we're asking. Be responsible for the, the uh, choices that you make. And, I mean, and protect the people that are still in nursing homes. You know, in the very beginning, this was, you know, the, the most concerned group. Yep. You know, we have to protect them. The Matilda and, Law. Yeah. And uh, they just did not do that. And we had... We couldn't do anything. Our hands were tied. We contacted, when we heard about them allowing uh, COVID patients back into the nursing homes, we contacted the attorney general's office. Uh, we had a phone interview with them. And this was before we lost our, our mom. And um, so we were concerned at that point. We knew something bad was gonna happen. But, uh, and unfortunately it did. So thank you so much. And please keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, the Attorney General, um, what kind of response has it been from her? Because I contact, we all contacted the, the Attorney General's office uh, back in, uh, I think it was in April, April, May. And uh, I, I, I talked to a, 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 an Assistant Attorney General uh, from Columbia County. And then I talked to an, uh, an investigator from, from the Attorney General's office. And I haven't seen anything, um, I haven't seen anything at all uh, I haven't heard anything at all from their office at all. I, I know the AG's report does reference ongoing investigations. I'm not sure if that help, helps answer your 
your question. I mean, I'm not with the Office of the Attorney General, but it, the report does cite that there's additional investigations that are ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. I'm, I'm sorry, we haven't heard. So I'm gonna move on to Senator Tedisco, but I wanna say to Cindy, Phil and Ted, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so, so sorry for your losses, but thank you. It's really important that you guys are here today and, and telling your story. And like you said, this is not about politics. Our loved ones don't wear an R or a D, right? So right. Thank right. that's correct. Thank that's you. Right. Thank we'll you. Senator Tedisco now. Thanks to Senator Serino. This, uh, first of all, let me thank Cindy and the Lizzie family for turning your personal tragedy into something so positive. You know, it takes a lot of effort and courage in a tragedy like this to speak up and help the other families across the state. And I think that's why uh, Senator Serrano, Senator Omero, uh, Senator Byrne, uh, our leaders are so uh, significantly involved and we're not gonna stop like Janice Dean, she's our leader uh, until we get a full investigation not just the numbers, but the metrics and the data that lead to an understanding of what the governor called a wildfire through dry grass that he, for the most part, had taken a part in. So we thank you very much for that. In terms of the governor, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of the governor, there are <coughs> those who say he's a pretty good wordsmith. He's a pretty good communicator. And uh, I guess to be a good communicator, you've got to be a good actor. And uh, maybe that's why he got an Emmy from Hollywood for his communication skills, for his acting. I know there's one area that he should never get an Emmy from, and that's transparency. Because this has been six to seven months of a total cover-up. And I've said in the past, and I'll say it again, the cover-up is always worse than what you're attempting to cover up. And as a bright guy, he should have understood that. But he continues to do so. And as you know, last Thursday, you asked about the AG. Well, AG James really tore the veil of secrecy back and showed uh, potentially, coming pretty close, I think, we still have more to learn, what the real numbers were for those who lost their lives in a nursing home, and also got sick in a nursing home, very sick, had to go to a hospital and passed away. Basically, she gave us an important part of the puzzle that was missing. 3,500 to 4,000 individuals who got so sick, they had to go to a hospital and passed away there. And the fact of the matter is, hospitals didn't lose these people's lives. They saved lives. The lives were lost because they got that contagion in a nursing home for the most part. We're talking about now what has been evaluated as a 50% underreporting of lost life. That is unbelievable. That's dramatic. It's totally unacceptable. And she has illustrated that where individuals die does matter. You know, the governor did say, what does it matter where they died? They died. Well, he knows better than everybody why it matters because it truly matters to him because he wouldn't have denied us those numbers and Commissioner Zucker wouldn't have denied those, uh, those numbers unless it mattered to him to protect his well-being in terms of blame. Now, he's gone through contortions, as you know, with that March uh, executive direction to say, hey, we can't discriminate against those who have COVID. We have to put him into a nursing home with individuals that may be compromised, but probably would be alive today if they didn't intermingle with those individuals who were put in there with COVID. And I think there's other evaluators to look at, the staffing, the staffing levels, those who travel to other, other nursing homes. But the fact of the matter, that made a dramatic difference in the loss of life. Now he's gotten to a point, after blaming the CDC, after blaming the federal government, after blaming the president of the United States, after blaming the workers, he's gotten to a point now where he's saying, if you died in a nursing home, it's a nursing home death. If you died in a hospital, it's a hospital death. Well, we know there's a big difference from what he's trying to put forth to us. The purpose and importance of understanding who died in a hospital 
is not that they lost their lives in hospitals. The hospitals didn't destroy their lives. It wears where the contagion was generated. And that was in the nursing homes. And now we know 35 to 4,000 were not added to that investigation that Commissioner Zucker did uh, to suggest, well, the peak of all those lost lives was before that March uh, executive order to put those individuals in there. Well, we don't know that because we never got the date at the time where these individuals who were in hospitals lost their lives. And uh, we don't know when they got the contagion. So we have to drill down. We still have to get the full numbers, but it's more than the numbers. It's all the surrounding issues that cause the loss of our most vulnerable populations. And I think you have to look at it this way. When the governor gives a definition, we're gonna categorize nursing home deaths in nursing homes that's taken place there but we have to categorize the deaths of those in hospitals as hospital deaths. Under that definition, if someone in a nursing home gets so sick with COVID, they have to leave and go to a hospital and an ambulance picks them up and is two minutes down the road and that individual dies of COVID in the ambulance, according to the governor's definition, that's an ambulance death because they didn't die in a nursing home, they didn't die in a hospital, but we know that death in the ambulance was caused by the contagion in the nursing home. That death in the hospitals, the close to 4,000, was caused by the contagion in the nursing home. And for six months, Senator Serino, myself, Senator Romero, many of our colleagues, Assemblyman Byrne, our leaders, have been begging, have been asking for those numbers from Commissioner Zucker, from those three leaders of those important Senate committees, the health, the aging, the investigative committee, we're heartened by the fact that Senator Skook has, has said, I'm gonna use those subpoenas if he doesn't come forth in his forthcoming. Well, he's not only gotta give us those numbers that he has, Commissioner Saki, he's gotta give us all the data surrounding that and, and what these orders actually meant and uh, what the staffing meant and what those who, who may not have sanitary conditions, we wanna look at the whole thing, a holistic evaluation. And, the fact of the matter is, there's foils out there to get this information. There's lawsuits out there to get the information. Senator Serino and I sent direct messages to those three leaders saying, it's time to use subpoena power back in September. He's not giving you the information. He blew by the deadline you asked him to give 27 answers to questions, plus, the, uh, plus those numbers. And now it's time for subpoenas. Well, it's been six months. And the irony, Miraculously, Commissioner Zucker has come out with the numbers. Coincidentally, on the same day last Thursday that the Attorney General came out with the numbers and said it's close to 13,000 individuals who lost their lives and close to 4,000 who lost them uh, in hospitals coming out of a nursing home with the contagion. That tells us they had the numbers for a long period of time. They were just holding it back. And it's a cover up, which is always worse than what you're trying to cover up. What we're asking now is for the majority members, the levers of strength in the Senate, the assembly, the governor is, is a progressive Democrat. They're from one affiliation and uh, one majority in both houses. We're asking them to use their subpoena power. If we could, we would have done it yesterday to get, get these answers. We don't have that power. We're not on those committees. We're not in the majority, but we're asking them to do that. Why are we asking them to do that? Because we don't want to see our most vulnerable population continue to go through what they've gone through in the past. We need the answers and we need closure for individuals like Cindy, your family and your brothers in the Lizzie family. And lastly, I'll say this about the governor. I know he's embarrassed now by these numbers. I know he's embarrassed that he hit all, the, hit all this information. I know that this may damage, and he thinks so, his reputation on how well he did with this COVID virus. I don't think they'll take back his Emmy. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't rise above getting these answers so we can better protect our most vulnerable population. So with your help, with all the leadership we had today, and I wanna thank the leaders, Leader Barkley and Leader Oak, for supporting Serena, myself, uh, Senator Romero, Assembly Byrne, to give us the opportunity to go out there and go after these issues. And uh, I'm just very hopeful with the support of somebody who's just a, 
an unbelievable dedicated person, Janice Dean, who uh, I think she's done more for this effort than anybody in, in maybe the world to say, this is wrong. We cannot let this stand. We have to find out, we have to drill down. We have to really know what went wrong and uh, get the truth. And if this doesn't rise above politics, I don't know what does rise above politics because if, if Senator Skoufos won't use those subpoenas, then he's got to help pass the bill that's in the Senate and the assembly that uh, Senator Serino, Romero, myself, uh, I think Assemblyman Byrne may be on it with uh, Assemblyman Ron Kim. And this shows why it's nonpartisan, a Democrat in the majority with several other Democrats on the bill for an outside independent bipartisan commission with individuals who have subpoena power. If he doesn't want to do that, then they've got to do their own bill for an investigation for an outside independent uh, a group of individuals on a, com a commission who have subpoena power. One of those three things has to happen because I know Janice Dean isn't going away. I know we're not going away. I know our leadership's not going away. And there's a lot of Democrats and Republicans aren't going away. The only thing we're concerned about now is if those subpoenas aren't used, it really looks like a cover up for Governor Cuomo. And he's covered it up enough as it is right now. We got to drill down and get the right answers. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tedisco, and I'm going to introduce uh, Senator Tom O'Mara, who is the committee ranking member for Senate Investigations and Government Operations, who really struck a nerve this week by trying to do the right thing by calling on the Investigations Committee to move forward with the subpoena. Thank you, Senator O'Mara. Thank you, uh, Sue, and thank you for everybody for participating uh, on here today. Uh, there's one thing uh that we have highlighted and that we are clear on this week we will not be muted we moved in the investigations committee to issue a subpoena to get these records that have been sought for months the empire center a good government group in new york state has sought these records through foil requests that have been stonewalled by Governor Cuomo for months. We will not be muted in our request to get to the bottom of what the real numbers are and what the real devastation that was wrought by the fateful March 25th directive of Governor Cuomo. A March 25th directive that required nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients that did not allow those nursing homes the ability to even test those patients coming in from hospitals for COVID. How is a nursing home supposed to determine whether to separate and cohort patients in a nursing home between the positive patients and the negative patients if that test isn't done before that is completed? The very next day after the March 25th directive, the American Medical Directors Association, the Society for Long-Term Care Providers in this country came out with a statement saying that they were concerned about that order, that the order was not based in science, had no medical basis, and was dangerous. Yet the governor proceeded under that order for another 45 days, sending fire into dry grass. And that's exactly what we had. Now we have an attorney general's report that comes out with a 50% increase in, fi in findings. Still no determination from that attorney general on whether and what impact that March 25th directive had in the increasing of those fatalities of our nursing home residents. You know, we sit here today with the advocacy of Janice Dean, with the advocacy of Cindy Lizzie and her brothers Phil and Ted on the loss of your loved ones. We are here to stand with you today to not be muted in our search for the truth, 
to get to the bottom of what happened. One thing we know from Attorney General James's report that those numbers are at a minimum 50% greater than they were. And her report is based on a sampling of nursing homes. It is not the complete picture. We deserve the complete picture. Janice Dean and Cindy Lizzie deserve the complete picture. You know, now we have been silenced in our Senate Investigations Committee by a chairman who, based on his position, has the authority to issue a subpoena on his own initiative. Under the legislative laws of New York State, I brought a motion before that committee to seek a majority of the members of that committee to issue such a subpoena that the chair of the committee has spoke about for months and threatening to use, yet has not done so. And the response was to make up a rule that doesn't exist, that that motion needed to be in writing. That's false, it's wrong. Uh, the response was for him to mute my microphone in that committee hearing. The response was for the chairman to not even allow the members of the committee to vote on the request for that subpoena. Which brings us to today and this press conference we're having, and I thank you, Senator Serino, and everyone else for participating here to help us get to the bottom of this uh, because we will not be silenced, we will not be muted, and we are here to stand up for the 13,000 plus individuals that died in nursing homes in New York State. You know, this is a pandemic, the likes of which this country and this world has not seen in 100 years. Did anybody really expect that mistakes would not be made in the handling of this? This is unprecedented territory, uncharted territory. Of course, mistakes were made. And mistakes will continue to be made. They continue to be made in the rollout of the vaccine that we're dealing with. They were made within our nursing homes and our precious senior citizens in this state with the fateful decision of March 25th. And we are here to get to the bottom of that today. Uh, and we look forward to the questions from the media, from your attention uh, to this issue. Uh, and hopefully the super majorities of both houses of the state legislature actually moving forward with an investigation uh, and actually perhaps terminating the governor's emergency powers that have existed for 11 months now. Our Republican conference in the Senate has now brought an amendment to the floor 10 times, 10 times to end the governor's emergency powers, which can be ended with a simple majority resolution of both houses of the legislature, end the governor's emergency powers, get the legislature back in the business of checks and balances and oversight on this out of control executive department and get to the bottom of what's going on here and actually be in the process of making decisions and discussing decisions that are being made that affect the lives of New Yorkers. Uh, I just wanna thank you all for participating. Uh, Janice, Cindy, Phil, and Ted, uh, God bless you for your involvement. Uh, may your loved ones rest in peace uh, and may your advocacy uh, assist us uh, in getting to the bottom uh, of that tragic and fateful March 25th decision. So uh, that, Senator Serino, I'll kick it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator O'Mara and everyone today. You know, like Senator O'Mara just said, this is a historic pandemic and no one was asking for perfection. But when you make a mistake, you have to admit it to start doing better. We have a chance to do right by these New Yorkers, but we need partners in the majority to do that. And now is the time. Um, I'd also, at this moment, I would just like to acknowledge some of the Senate members that have joined us today. We have um, Senator Helming, Senator Borello, Senator Rath, Senator Wyke, Senator Palumbo, and Senator Steck. I think I, I got everybody. And um, Leader Barkley, if you would like to um, just uh, make mention of who your assembly members are that are on? I would. I'll try to see. Thank you, uh, Senator Serino. We have uh, Assemblyman Stefano, looks like Se Assemblyman Mantelow, 
um, Assemblyman Gallahan, Assemblyman Salka, and uh, Assemblyman Angelino, and Assemblywoman Giglio. I think I hit everybody. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. And I know that some members have um, submitted. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt? Uh, we have uh, so many women Walsh and obviously we heard from uh, someone named Kevin Burns too. I apologize. Th thank you, Leader Barkley. Uh, I also know that some members have submitted quotes in the chat box for your use. Um, so if anyone has a question, if you could just please raise your hand. Um, can you do that or okay. Sue, could I uh, mention something? Sure, Jim. You know, Senator Romero and you have talked about there's going to be mistakes. But this is the governor who said politics is never going to solve this problem. We've got to follow the science. I think most people now saw the New York Times article. I don't know if they saw Sarah Foss's article in the Daily Gazette yesterday. What it illustrates is that this governor did anything but follow the science. Nine of his top workers for the Department of Health have resigned. And I just wanna read a paragraph which suggests exactly what he was doing. Well, Senator Tedisco, would you mind if we do that after I open it to questions? I apologize, because I think some people were gonna to have to jump off. Would okay, you go ahead. Is that okay? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, all right, first we'll go to Dan Clark, if you want to unmute your microphone. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you loud and clear, Dan. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Anytime. So the subpoena that you've drafted, um, obviously, I think that we've talked a lot over the past couple of months about the numbers, the discrepancy between hospital deaths and nursing home deaths. But what else would the subpoena be seeking in terms of information? And how would you use that information? What's your plan once you actually get the data and what you're seeking from the governor's office? Um, yeah, that's very broad. You know, we there's a whole host of things. Like we mentioned, you have to know where you went wrong in order to correct things. During this, the hearings and everything, we heard from many people who suggested actually the same thing that I had brought to the commissioner of health and never got an answer on, but to do uh, step down units where you would have facilities that are specifically just for COVID related and um, staff that just stay there for COVID. There would be money from the CARES Act, but we had no response. So um, I think, uh, you know, it all goes back to the March 25th order and why that was decided on. So I think that's where, you know, there's one person at the top, right? The buck stops at the top and it was the governor that made that order. And can I just ask uh, one quick follow-up for Senator O'Mara, if he's still there? Just wondering, after that uh, really tense investigations meeting this week, if you've had a conversation with Senator Scoopis about any of that and um, why that was blocked so harshly. Uh, I have not uh, had a conversation with Senator Scoopis since then. Uh, uh, as, as you're aware, most of uh, or a lot of the members of the legislature, despite us being in session, are not actually... Uh, in Albany. Uh, I have not uh, uh, seen uh, or spoken to uh, Senator Scoofus uh, since the meeting the day before uh, yesterday. Thank you both. Uh, Senator, may I just chime in really quick? Uh, Sue, thank you. Uh, I know that the senators have made attempts for the uh, subpoenas, just the petition that's been circulated from the Assembly Republican Conference uh, we do lay it out very specifically in writing when we're calling for additional hearings for the purpose of subpoenaing information. So I'll just read you uh, the petition that was circulated. Um, call on the New York State Commissioner of Health, Dr. Howard Zucker, to testify and provide all data on nursing home deaths, as well as communications from the DOH and other parties that led to the decision to craft, implement, and override its March 25th directive as well as withhold this data from the legislature and public for so many months. So that, that is at least what we put in writing as a petition to our colleagues in the pertinent committees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assembly Member. And Dan, you know, I think when you think about this too, like 
why was that decision made for March 25th? What data was there? So we really would want like texts, emails, any communications that went on between um, the governor's office and the Department of Health. I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, we had asked the uh, commissioner um, at the hearing about, you know, were, uh, were their decisions ind independently made? Oops, sorry. And uh, he kind of danced on the answer. So um, those are some of the things that we need to get answers to. And, and that's what only the uh, subpoena will be able to handle for an independent investigation. So thank you, Dan. Thank you. Now we'll go to Kate, Lisa, if you wanna unmute your microphone. Hi, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, Kate. Me, okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I have two questions, actually. Um, first, I'd like to know, I know that on Friday, the Senate Republicans, you sent a letter to the state congressional delegation asking for an update on that federal inquiry into um, the, the state's COVID policies in the public nursing homes. So I'm just curious if there's been any response to that letter or any update about that inquiry. The other thing I'd like to know is, um, I know back in the spring, the governor did at one point say, that um, you know, nursing homes would be subject to losing their licenses if they don't follow the proper uh, safety protocols and things like that. And I know in the AG's report, there was a large section talking about the complaints and um, the hundreds of complaints that were received about that very kind of thing. So I'm just curious about what kind of push will there be to also hold the facilities accountable? Will there be any push to remove licenses and, and what will happen there? Uh, thank you, Kate. You know, as far as I know, there hasn't been a response um, from the federal government. And with regard to uh, what went on, you know, there are a lot of things that we've been talking about for years, you know, safe staffing. I actually co-sponsored the bill. I don't know about, um, you know, uh, the other members in my conference, but we, those were issues. There were issues about them getting PPE uh, right from the beginning. You heard that not only from the nursing homes, but the uh, hospitals as well. And certainly uh, they should be held accountability if there was negligence. But these, like I said, these re uh, nursing homes needed the resources and the state failed them. So that was a huge part of the problem. You know, it's very easy to pay, play a blame game, right? When you realize what you did was wrong, but you didn't admit it. So... Thank you, Kate. Okay. Next, we have a question in the chat. Um, for the leadership, what was the most egregious part of the Attorney General's report for you, and how would you have handled it differently than the Cuomo administration? I don't know, for leadership, or did they? I guess, um, for us, you know, just finding that just a small portion um, was, when you look at the nursing homes and numbers, just a smidgen they were, were looked at. So we want a whole report. We want a whole thorough investigation like we've been calling on. So um, I hope that that answered your question. Senator, I'll, I'll just fill in because I'm not sure if uh, Leader Barclay's uh, away at the moment on the assembly yeah. side, but the, I think something that's very, very shocking, uh, and Senator O'Mara mentioned this or alluded to this, the AG's report used a sample of 62 nursing homes to come up with this number. So even the attorney general didn't get this data that we've been seeking. It's unclear if she asked for it, but why wasn't that data even used in her report? Um, and she, the attorney general's office report actually cites a section of the July report that was released by the DOH and that July report, I think a lot of us think will be largely discredited when this information comes to light. Um, and, and that July report was a full on defense of the March 25th directive, which the AG's report at the same time says very well may likely have led to more harm and death uh, from our nursing homes. Uh, so I, I think it's shocking that the, the attorney general's office didn't get that information either. Um, but it very clearly validated all of our concerns, uh, which we may, we all thought was the case. Um, and that's really what the alarming thing is that I, I don't think they got the information that they needed and it just strengthens our call for more investigation. 
Yeah, and also like I, I spoke about the step down facilities, that would have been the perfect answer to do that. We saw the resources that were put in um, to New York City when they did the Javits Center. There were places for people to go. And that, you know, when you have when you have something like this, you have COVID, it attacks the elderly the worst. And I feel like the, our seniors have been always an afterthought. And you know, so that was one of the things that they could have very easily done and given the resources to these nursing homes that they so desperately needed. So one of the things that is disconcerting is DOH and Commissioner Zucker uh, absolved the governor, governor from any blame with that uh, March executive order, but he didn't have the 4,000 deaths of individuals who died in hospitals in the timetable for that. So when he came out and suggest, oh, it must be the workers, because the high peak of the loss, nursing home deaths was before the executive order. We don't know when these 4,000 nursing home deaths in hospitals took place. That's why we have to drill down and get all these answers. And for them to come out and just say, he's absolved, it wasn't his fault, it didn't make any difference. I think that's very egregious. And the cover up of these numbers is very egregious. There was no purpose for it unless he thought he would get blamed for something and for doing that. Yes. Okay. And um, so now we'll go to Bernadette Hogan. If you want to unmute your microphone. Hi guys. How are you? Um, if the family members are still on, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about their mother that they lost. Again, so sorry for your loss. Just what was she like? How old was she when she passed away? And uh, yeah, just wanted to hear a little bit more about her and the family's experience. Well, um, she was 93 years old when she passed away, but she was physically fit. Um, and um, we, we knew that, uh, you know, we were, when we first heard about the COVID, we were very concerned, obviously, because, you know, uh, because it's such a devastating disease. Um, what was the other part of your question? What was the... Uh, yeah, just wanted to know a little bit more about what she was like as a person and if you could oh just describe, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful woman. She was so heart loving. Family. Just family everything first. was about our family. And uh, her famous quote was, when one gets cut, we all bleed. Yeah. And that's that was our family. We were so close. And uh, we, uh, she was so close to our dad. They were married 64 years before our father passed away in 2016. And they were so close and they were a perfect example of what uh, married life should be family life. and family life should be. And they were, she was, our mom was like, we, like I had mentioned that we visited her every day she was our best at, friend. at, uh, at the Trisian house. And, um, we, we, you know, uh, she was just beautiful. She was, she was warm. She was loving. She was great sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't say enough about, it. I know, uh, you know, everybody's mom is, is important to them. We can only speak for ourselves in saying that she was our life. And, and uh, you know, to, to die this way and, and under the circumstances. And being alone. With, and being alone. Being alone was horrible. Her Absolutely being used horrible. to, yes, being used to seeing us every day and then shut out on March 12th. And that was the last time that we could comfort her. And we fed her dinner every night. We put her to bed we, every night. We tucked her in every night like we, she did with us when we, we were her, yeah. uh, young, when we were kids. We took her to the chapel every night to pray with her. And uh, that gave her great comfort. She knew we, we'd, we'd be there the next day. And thank you so much. And Bernadette, you always put a human um, side to this. So, you know, thanks for asking about their mom. And did you have another question, Bernadette? No, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your coverage that you've been doing too. And I know um, going to, we're gonna call on uh, Morgan McKay. And then there was a question about safe staffing that we'll talk about. I think Morgan put a question in the chat. Oh. While we look for that one, we'll answer this one from Karen DeWitt, who said, um, I wanted to know what you all thought about the safe staffing bill for hospitals and nursing homes now making its way through the assembly. 
As you know, the Attorney General's report found a correlation between lower staffing ratios and higher rates of COVID deaths. Do you support this bill? Yeah, and like I mentioned earlier, I've co-sponsored the bill for many years. Um, we we know that we have to find and re retain staff. We have to incentivize training, and the state has to put the resources forward to fill that gap because a lot of times these nursing homes and hospitals uh, just do not have the funds to do so, and uh, you know they're strangled. We hear that all the time from them. Um, so that is something that is really, really uh, important. So thank you, Karen, for asking that question. And then did we have more? Uh, Senator, so, so if I could add, if I could add on that staffing issue, uh, you, you know, we, we've had a nursing shortage uh, in this state and in this country for a very long time. Uh, the legislature had has made efforts over the years to uh, increase and incentivize uh, individuals going into the career of nursing. And, and that's something that, that this conference uh, has certainly fostered and continues to, uh, uh, to work for. But it's a matter of having available workforce as well as just the ability to pay for it. Uh, perhaps uh, a few years ago when Governor Cuomo was pushing the $15 minimum wage uh, for fast food workers, it might have made more sense to push a higher minimum wage for individuals going into careers such as nursing, uh, such as helping those with developmental disabilities, uh, rather than prioritizing the labor force in fast food restaurants, if there'd been a priority in providing a better wage for uh, entry level uh, uh, nursing positions uh, and all levels uh, of nursing care, you would see a greater supply of individuals uh, wanting to be dedicated to get involved in the workforce and do that, yet this state chose to prioritize fast food workers rather than healthcare workers. Uh, and that has, in the process, resulted in the moving of many people from lower level healthcare positions to seeking work at a fast food restaurant because it pays a better wage. It's had the exact opposite effect of what we would like to see uh, of prioritizing uh, of our uh, of our healthcare workers. Uh, thank you, Senator O'Mara. And I think while we're trying to see if, um, for Morgan's question, uh, Mar Marina had asked a question or had her hand raised, Marina? Hi, um, Senators. I was wondering um, if the data requests that Senators are asking for, if that includes information, including um, the number of infections at nursing homes, um, and if that's something that, um, you know, Senators are looking for as well. Oh, it, it cut out a little bit for me, Marina. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if Senators are asking uh, the Department of Health about how many uh, nursing home residents have caught COVID-19. Um, New York is the only state that's not releasing that um, data. Um, and if senators are aware whether the Department of Health is going to continue providing the number of residents who died at hospitals. Um, yes, and those are my questions. Yeah, no, and we've asked that question. That's the part of the data that we're absolutely looking for. It's so important. So um, we don't know if uh, the, with the DOH looking forward. So, but we, like I said, we have a bill um, that I believe, and I believe that Re Senator Rivera has a bill too. So again, the majority could compel that question and, and should, like we've been calling on all along. And the Department of Health's tally doesn't include nursing home residents who probably or likely died of COVID at hospitals. Is that data that the senators are asking for or um, has, have senators asked why uh, the DOH tally didn't include those probable deaths at hospitals? Oh, yes. Yes, we've been asking for all of that data. And I, I have a um, bill that would require that reporting. 
Okay. Uh, we've been asking that question over and over again, um, not, getting in, not getting the answers. That's why this is so important. And are senators calling for an investigation of of like uh, a full investigation that would include looking at potential missteps and errors by nursing homes and hospitals? Um, you know, some nursing homes are facing fines for not following infection protocols. And, um, you know, I've spoken to nursing home administrators who said a big challenge was just not getting information from hospitals about whether um, residents or, uh, you know, even had symptoms of COVID or anything like that, which made it a challenge to separate um, patients, uh, COVID patients from non-COVID patients. Right, that's all part of the data. Like, you know, data matters, details matter. And that's all of the questions that we've been asking that we, we need to uh, get those uh, questions answered. And we were talking about needing more testing so we would know if people were sick. The rapid test um, should have been a priority, not so much for the bills game, right? You know, the nursing homes and these facilities desperately needed them. Um, so that was where our priority, um, where the state's priority should have been. Um, and then uh, I think Morgan has a question. So this will be our last question. And Morgan McKay wrote, um, does anyone want to respond to the Attorney General's report um, about repealing the immunity clause for health providers? Is there any support to repeal? I, for me, I think if there's negligence, then they, there shouldn't be immunity, plain and simple. I don't know if anybody, any of the other um, senators here want to... Uh, have a word to say. I think Senator Tedisco, you're muted. Yeah, I was interviewed the other day by one of the stations. As, as you know, uh, we voted for partial elimination of immunity uh, in the New York State uh, sessions we had, but uh, these are our most vulnerable populations. The family members expect wonderful care. Uh, and if there's a misstep in negligence in some way, I don't think we can allow this to take place. Uh, uh, I get a lot of calls. I don't know about you, Sue, but this is probably the number one call I get from family members who say, geez, my loved one has bed sores and, and they're not turning them and uh, they're not uh, taking care of them and they're, they're not feeding them. They're not making sure they're eating. They're not contacting us. And I do think uh, that we've got to eliminate uh, all that immunity right now. And uh, if they need help from the state of New York, uh, it might be that they need more assistance in staffing. Uh, they need more assistance in understanding that maybe putting asymptomatic workers back into nursing homes might have been a part of the problem or a series of individuals during this COVID virus who are traveling from one nursing home to another might have carried it in or they weren't isolating patients in the correct way or the sanitary conditions weren't, weren't appropriate. And if it's serious, real negligent, I think we've got to eliminate that, that immunity clause and they've got to be responsible because we've got to be able to say to the constituents we represent out there who th are thinking about putting their parents or have to put their family members in a nursing home, it's safe. We're working to make it better. We're gonna stop those things that cause this wildfire through dry grass that the governor uh, has talked about. And the only way to do that is to hold them up to a higher standard. If we do that, you won't see the negligence that I think has been taking place in the past. They'll be more careful. If we give them immunity, what do they have to lose? If they, if they are more interested in revenues than they are in doing the right thing and making a reasonable profit. Thank you, Senator Tedesco. You know, like I said, right from the beginning of all this, when I spoke about the step-down units, they did that. This could have prevented so many families um, from being in these situations. And uh, so I, and I can't thank the uh, media enough because you stayed on. I think we've been on for almost a full hour. So uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys really have gone above and beyond. And thank you to the families uh, to Janice and Cindy and Ted and Phil. Um, I, I can't thank you all enough for sharing your heartfelt stories. And you, you know, like you, like Bernadette said, you put a heart, uh, a human face to all of this. And uh, unfortunately, as we've seen, our seniors are just kind of left in the dust. And that's why we're here today to fight for them. So thank you uh, so much for my colleagues that have stayed on and have been a uh, tremendous force uh, behind this push. So thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank and, you so uh, much. Thank you. Thank great you. Day. Thank, thank you. All of you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Th
Thanks, Thank you, Senators. Thank you yes, all thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Thank so. you. Thank, thank you. God, you. Bless. God bless you. God bless, God bless you all. all, too. Thank you. <laughs>